So I'll call to order this meeting of the Somerset Berkeley Regional School Committee at 6.02 p.m. Due notice having been posted. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions may be made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. We'll do a roll call of members present. Mr. Fensitemaker? Here. Ms. Ashley? Present. Ms. Ferreira? Present. Mr. Machado? Present. Ms. O'Brien? Present. Mr. Vieira? Present. Ms. Kettle? Present. Um, and the chair is present also with us this evening. It's our superintendent of schools, Mr. Jeffrey Schoonover, our director of business and finance, Mr. Ron Taro, and our director of special education, Ms. Megan Ashton. Um, along with our recording secretary, Robin Vaccaro. Could I ask you if you're able to please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, the next regularly scheduled meeting of this body will be on Tuesday, May 21st, 2024, in the Somerset Berkeley Regional High School Library, right here. I want to um, extend a welcome to um, Ms. Ashley, who's a uh, new appointed rep from the Somerset School Committee. Welcome back, Mr. Machado. Thank you. <laughs> and um, not really welcome back, but Ms. Ferreira is now the uh, one of the elected members of the um, Regional School Committee, so welcome to everyone. Um, and I'll just note, too, that we will reorganize the committee at our uh, meeting in May following the Berkeley town elections. Okay, the first item on the agenda this evening under student teaching and learning is a report from our student representatives, Brian Vieira and Allie Keller. Oh, good evening, everyone. So just to start off with a few things regarding academics. Um, so starting the week of May 6th through the second week of May 17th, that is the week of AP exams. So up until this point, students and teachers have been working hard to prepare for those two weeks of exams. So I know most exams are on the Monday, Wednesday, and then I think there is some on Tuesday for uh, some virtual high school classes um, as well. And then upcoming this week, um, Thursday and Friday, there's a performance of Mean Girls. Um, Thursday and Friday will be at 7 p.m. And then Saturday, there's a performance both at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. As for spring sports, we have baseball, softball, tennis, track, and lacrosse. And as far as I know, lacrosse is enjoying their new opportunity to play. Uh, clubs and extracurriculars, we have the DECA Club leaving this Friday for Nationals in Anaheim, California. Um, and the Career Fair also happened last week and we've had lots of positive feedback about it. And then, so I'll talk a little bit about what I know about um, something that is an event for juniors tomorrow called Credit of Life, the Credit for Life. So we had a presentation on it yesterday, so I'll talk a little bit about what I know, still a little confused, but We'll, we'll work through it. So, uh, Credit of, of Life is an event for juniors that's sponsored by Bay Coast Bank. And it essentially teaches students um, how to go through healthy financial practices. So, you'll go from, so you're given a software program on your Chromebook and you select what your, uh, what occupation you're looking at. So, you'll select uh, your occupation and it'll give you like a, a base salary, um, uh, credit like a give it will assign you a credit score and then you'll go through stations like buying a car buy, uh, buying a house renting an apartment and then it will throw like uh, rainy day events at you and you'll have to try to budget through that so that's tomorrow um, for an hour and a half during period a so all students that are in their wellness class or um, I think it's a any wellness class will report to the gym during period a for an hour and a half for for that event um, so that that'll be exciting something new I think um, That'll be beneficial. And that is all, all we have for today. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? I just w I wanted to know uh, if you went to Career Day, how, how that went. Yeah, so I was actually um, impressed with her. The first year having a career fair, having the, I think it was 48 or 50, something in that, in that range, um, it, was, it was very beneficial to see the different aspects of um, what each professional in each different profession goes through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
so it's definitely definitely beneficial to see that wide range of options. I don't know if you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I, I thought it was really well organized. Fantastic. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you both. Okay. Lots of good things happening. Huh? And the sun is shining. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the next item on the agenda is to consider approval of the HOSA Future Health Professionals trip to Houston, Texas on June 25th through 29th. And I think Ms. Little is here to give us some more. Yeah, if I stand over here, of course. wherever you're comfortable. Wherever. Okay, perfect. Uh, first, before I start, I just wanted to ask if anybody got the little pamphlet that I emailed out. Fabulous. Yes. I'm going to leave extra copies here just in case anybody needs some. Um, those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Lindsay Littlefield. I am a Project Lead the Way teacher here as well as a HOSA advisor. I do want to take a second to acknowledge Grace Tweedy who actually joins me today and Ryan Vieira who is actually both HOSA members. Grace Tweedy is actually the first place winner in HOSA in the pharmaceutical science. So very proud of her and she's one of the people that will be uh, benefiting from this program and specifically today. So thank you for joining me. Um, so I am here today to discuss Health Occupation Students of America. We always compete at a state conference. This is an opportunity for students to work with other peers and health professionals and really explore health careers. It's a really great alignment tool with the Project Lead the Way program we have here at the high school. And we actually compete in different pharmaceutical and science and medical endeavors on a national and international level. The only people who ever get to compete though are the people who qualify at states. And that's very difficult to do. This year we had three people qualify, Grace placing first in her field, and then we had a team of two that placed second place, which is Nate Mello and Jasper Troutman. So we have three students who are well qualified and going on to internationals representing our school, which I think is so cool. It's hard to get there. I competed in the HOSA when I was you guys' age, and I only got there once out of like my four years, so it's very difficult to do this. Um, with that being said, though, I am asking for not only approval for the trip upon contingency of your approval, you know, once you get the paperwork, which is actually heading your way this week, um, but I'm also asking for support and funding. This is a very expensive trip. Students do pay for it themselves. HOSA is a smaller chapter in Massachusetts. It's not like the other states where they actually pay for those winners to go to internationals. We have to pay ourselves, and we're a small chapter here at SBRHS, and we're growing, but this is how we have to grow our chapter and how we grow our Project Legal Aid program. So I'm asking for your support and some dues that we do have to pay, one of them being the national fee, which is $90 for students to compete. That is just the straight out from competition, showing up to the conference. It pays for their meals, their lunches, and their dinners at the conference, as well as the social gatherings that they have where they get to interact with medical professionals across the world. In addition, I'm asking that you pay for the HOSA uniform blazer. That is a uniform that is specific to the international conference. It is required of the students to have the blazer with the embroidered album on it. If they don't have it, they risk getting kicked out of the conference, and I don't want our students to have that experience. And then lastly, the trading pins, which are a little bit less expensive. They're only $40, but this is a fun way for students to actually interact with other students internationally. It's a part of the host of competition that during the free time and when they get to go to the conference and just relax, they actually go up to one another and trade their state pins. We have to purchase those pins. I would love if our students could go with 50 pins and be able to meet one person from every state at minimum um, and trade pins with everybody. It's a great networking tool. Cool. Does anyone have any questions? So what was the total per student? Yeah, so the total per student, I apologize, the total per student would be $228 and then with $200 towards travel, so it would be about $448 per student, equaling up to $1,284 total completely. And what, was, what portion of that were you asking us to consider? I am asking you to consider to supporting us with $1,284 upon approval. What's the total cost though? I think that's the Oh, the I'm sorry. The total cost per student without any assistance is $2,328. With your support, that brings the total per student with your support down to $1,900. So our goal is to get it down to $1,300. We also have a fundraiser coming up called Kiss the Seniors Goodbye. The students will be selling Christian kisses with like little candy grams. So we're working our way towards getting that price. But if we could just lower it a little bit to allow the students the opportunity to finance and maybe fundraise a little bit more close the gap between the price and the eligibility to go. Mr. Michelle. So today you're you're looking to 
have us fund 1200 and twelve. what was the amount again? Uh, 1284 84. And uh, per, okay. per student? No, total. 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 I can okay. pass this your way too. So, um, and the price breakdown is on page five. All right, and that's the $90 for the national fee, $98 for the blazer, and $40 for the pins? Yes. So it ends up being $228 per student that I'm asking um, at minimum. And then there's and the then additional $200 for travel. to defray travel. Just to assist. I was wondering where that is. So that's oh, okay. Line. Yes, yes. Okay. So the 228 is the actual, like, the three things that they mm -hmm. desperately need for this trip. I'm asking that you go above and beyond and like, donate an additional $200 just per travel. These students work so hard. They're part of Project Lead the Way program. they staying after school. This is not something that we design during class and they're in class and they get a grade for it. This is, they're spending time after school studying, working hard, learning skills. Grace, for example, was after school every day with me for like two weeks it felt like and she was donning her gloves, putting on her scrubs, counting out medicine, learning how to actually prescribe a medication. Something that's not specifically aligned with PLCW, but it, it takes it one step further in our curriculum. And that's gonna set her up for her future. She's been now in the field of essentially pharmaceutical science. So now Grace will know if she wants to go into that field or not. She's had that exposure and that experience and she's met professionals there. Questions? Yes. Ms. Andrews, if I may add something. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier this year, I did apply for an Innovation Pathways grant, uh, and the grant w which uh, we did receive, uh, funds are to support uh, our biomedical and cybersecurity Innovation Pathways programs, mostly with uh, equipment and professional development, but I did include uh, $1,750 specifically to support students to attend this conference knowing that uh, we had the, the first year of success last year, and if I'm not mistaken, Ryan, you attended, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did Allison? You, okay, so um, so we do have the 1750, which I just informed Ms. Littlefield prior to this meeting that we had that money there. Um, so that that is already going to help alleviate yes, uh, some of the bad. cost here. And that number was not included in my right. little informational <clears throat> graphic. I just found out about it today. So I apologize for not including it, but no, that is not, your, huge not your fault. I <laughs> truly appreciate that one. It's such a huge help. So I, I just have a couple of quick questions. Yeah. Regarding the blazes, this is more for Mr. Schoonover. Mm -hmm. Regarding the, the Decker blazes, how do we, is that something that we purchase for the students or is that something, that is my only concern uh, about, you know, if we fund the blazers for this. I'm glad that you have the grants, mm -hmm. so I'm glad that that's, because that was a part where I was struggling. The national fees, the pins, um, it's just that I have to try to keep, as a school committee member, what's, you know, we did it for the DECA that we paid them for the registration fees. So the only thing that I'm struggling with is the, are, are the blazers. So if that's something that you can use at 1750 plus, that would be great. Do you mind if I elaborate a little bit upon the uniform? Sure. Just to fill in some blanks, because I know if you're not part of HOSA, it's always like it's foreign land. You're like, who is this? What is what even is HOSA? Um, so HOSA is actually designated, they want the state competitors to actually wear these blazers as well. Because Massachusetts is so small and because we're still starting up our chapter, we are exempt from that for the next couple of years because we're a new chapter. However, I will say that when we go to you know, our state competition and everybody's in the blazer and we're standing, it, it's almost a little like upsetting and frustrating and sometimes it's a way of feeling left out. So my goal with these blazers is actually while we're purchasing three this year, I've talked to the students and they're actually gonna donate them back upon after the conference so that way we can use them next year. And my goal is that throughout more people coming into this program, qualifying for internationals, that we start building up that wardrobe and that wardrobe would just stay in property of the school and the students would borrow it. That's different now. <laughs> that's my now, goal. Now it's it more like school uh, uniforms for sports. Like that's yeah, right. that's a whole other issue now because you know the deck. I know the students keep them. I believe, at least Correct. to my knowledge. So now it's a, now we're back to the yes. sports. Now I can support that again, okay. knowing that. <laughs> I'm glad you give us more information. Yes, I apologize, but yes, that I think that works best for not only you but also for the students because once they graduate, there's not necessarily. A much use for a HOSA uniform with the emblem on it, but it would be useful for incoming freshmen and whatnot. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Schoonover, I just have a question about the grant. So the grant, uh, is there a certain date by which the funds have to be expended? June 30th. Of this, okay, mm -hmm. so, this, so it's, and are there, and I am assuming that this would be the last um, need for those funds. I'm like, I don't know if there's anything beyond nationals or. I uh, know this Nothing is the highest level you can go and host. So this is international. So it's okay. not just nationals. It's there is actually um, a group from China that's coming. Okay, great. So internationals, highest you can go. So there's nothing that would occur in the three days between this conference. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> just making sure. Okay. Can I clarify then? Would it make sense um, to um, for the committee, separate from the grant, mm -hmm. to cover? The national fee, the uniform, and the pin, which would be two hundred and twenty-eight dollars per student, which would be, I think, consistent with how we have supported similar groups in the past, and then perhaps use the seventeen fifty from the grant to defray travel. Mm -hmm. Does that seem sensible? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's see if I can put that in motion. Um, in that case, then I would um, entertain a motion to approve, um, let's see, $228 per student um, for the, to attend the HOSA International Conference um, to cover the national fee, the uniform fee, and the PIN fee. And um, I don't even know if you need this, but then to authorize Mr. Schoonover to use the remaining funds in the grant of $1,750 to offset um, travel costs. Can I mm -hmm. change the motion? Mm -hmm. you don't mind? Um, because I think the original motion, the original proposal was for $1,284, and I'm assuming that includes the $200, correct? Yes. So, I don't know where the 228. Um, oh, per, 228 oh, per oh, student. Flip to page five. Yeah. Yeah, I have a. Oh, here, I apologize. But the two. I'm just trying to still. You have three students, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. At 228. Mm -hmm. It comes yes. out to 600. Correct. That's the travel expense. Correct. Because then I have the 600. So originally you had 200 dollars for each student. Correct. Uh, Additional. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Right. So yeah. now. Because the numbers were still off for me. Mm -hmm. no, All right. No so in that case, I like to make a motion um, that we take care of the national fees, the pins, and the uniform blazers that will continue to be property of the school um, for a total of six hundred and eighty-four dollars. And do we need to make a motion for Mr. I don't think we do because it's a grant. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that would be our, that would be okay. Motion. All right. Second. The motion by Mr. Machado and seconded by Ms. Ashley. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous work. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda this evening is to consider pre approval of a 2025 student trip to Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. Mr. Talbot and the company. Presentation. Everything in the packet is what we have in the presentation. If it's easier to go over the paper, okay. the only uh, difference is we corrected the 2 a.m. Uh, double talk in the uh, in the packet on our. I was supposed to have a student representative from our last trip here, but I don't know what happened. It's part of her uh, civics project. project. 
but I did include the link to her presentation uh, inside the uh, electronic copy that you guys got. you guys offer time if you want me just to streamline or if you want me to go through the whole presentation. Yeah, I don't want to occupy your time too much. But streamline works. We just digest. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Much, of, much of what we have to say is the same as last yeah. time. We just so, change different locations. So for those that, for you, those of you that were on the board uh, last uh, last time, um, we are coming back from COVID and we're looking to uh, do our travel programs again. This year, we just came back from um, Portugal and Spain. Uh, and to try to keep with our original five-year uh, plan that we had prior to COVID, and then the world you know, shut down, um, we wanted to run this year's trip, see how it went. And then we are going to try next year's trip to so Costa Rica, and then come back with another five-year plan with the hopes that it won't cause a pandemic. And that way, students <laughs> yeah, yeah. students um, will know freshman year what trips to expect so parents can save money and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, we decided to do uh, South America again. We've done the Galapagos before. Uh, then uh, this year we went to Europe. And then uh, we we're looking to go back to South America. One of our destinations from our five-year uh, plan was uh, Peru. Peru, there was too much political unrest right now, so we decided um, you know, we were talking about possible uh, Italy trip, uh, where next year it's going to be a Jubilee year, um, and the way that April vacation falls uh, with Easter, we were just concerned with, um, you know, I I issues in uh, Italy. So we went with the Insiders um, tour of Costa Rica, and the reason why we went with this one is uh, the kids are able to immerse in the culture of uh, Costa Rica. Uh, as well as get to see the, um, you know, the, the rainforest and experience the rainforest. Uh, but some of the feedback that we got from our trip this time around is that there was some, some people felt like there was too much downtime. So we went with a traditional Costa Rican trip where you have the science and the nature part, as well as the cultural integ integration, and where it's more um, organized and the kids are more involved in act more activities while we're down there. So um, like all our other uh, trips that we've been on, this is going to be linked up with a one credit class that the students will, when they come back, um, they'll share their uh, travel experiences and present either at our multicultural week, our uh, elementary schools, middle schools, um, and, or to you guys. Or to the yes. school community. If like uh, Ms. Gleason, would you like to uh, go over the uh, itinerary? So when we do South America, um, we leave uh, very early in the morning. So it's like a 2 a.m. departure from the school. We go up to Logan Airport. Um, we requested to leave on the Saturday uh, of school vacation. Uh, so it's not taken away from the kids' uh, school time, but that does fluctuate sometimes either Friday or Saturday. Um, we don't do the, uh, the booking of the flight, so it's one of those things just to keep in mind. But we did request a Saturday departure date, which would go Saturday to Sunday. And like Mr. Tava said and Ms. Camarajo, we did uh, kind of highlight the Spain-Portugal trip recently during Multicultural Week. Uh, the students who went on the trip not only wrote essays and uh, did various projects, but they also presented to their classmates during uh, Multicultural Week. So we had, we had a good time with that. And it's um, great to see their perception um, of, of the trip. Um, and they all took different themes, be it food or um, the architecture or or just the music, and it, it was a really great time, and it was nice to see the students reflect on the trip as well. So I'll just briefly go through our itinerary. Uh, we're going to leave uh, from Boston to San Jose, where we'll meet the tour guide, and then we're going to move to San Carlos, where we're going to focus on, uh, there's a craft uh, project. One of the highlights from our last trip that the students really liked was the engagement on some of the, the tasks we had as a class. Uh, we, we did a, a tile project, and we had a dance lesson, which was too great. Flamenco dancers are right there. So if you ever need a flamenco lesson, there you go. There, there uh, is a so video out there. I haven't seen it, but I don't want to see it. <laughs> so day two, we do get a, a craft workshop, and then we're going to visit our school as well, so our students will get a chance to practice their Spanish firsthand, not only 
throughout the, the trip, but also in a, a school in Costa Rica. And then we'll have a nice view of the volcano, as you can see in the picture there. Day three, we're going to move. And this trip, like our two chaperones, our, our group leader, Matanis, has an intense trip. Uh, we're going to move to the, the river for a nice boat trip um, in San Carlos. And then day four is Monte Verde. Uh, we take a bus there. And then they do have a horseback uh, ride. So. <clears throat> day five is also in the Monte Verde region. Um, and they have uh, some we call them canopy tours. And they're raised uh, canopies and the hanging bridges um, up through the jungle there. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And then later in the day, we also have a cooking lesson. Uh, day six, Punta Arenas, uh, it says beach right there. It's at a, a national uh, park. Um, you know, it didn't look like your, I don't know if you call it like a five star uh, beach, but uh, we'll be, um, I think they're going to do some snorkeling that day, so we'd like the kids to know how to swim for this trip. Uh, day seven uh, is another national park, the Manuel Antonio National Park. And then we move to San Jose before departing back to the United States. And then just to point out the <clears throat> on day five, the hanging bridges, the purpose of the hanging bridges is um, when you have the ecologists going up in the canopy, uh, studying the wildlife and the biodiversity in the canopy. Um, so those are actual uh, research station uh, hanging bridges uh, that we'd be uh, going on. Right, so um, what's included? Just, it's not nice. Is this going over here? Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, so what's included in the trip? So the round trip flights are included, um, just like last time. We, we're going with ACIS, who is um, they're a wonderful tour company to go with. Round trip flights um, with motor coach while we're there. Um, there's no trains. We won't, be, we won't be on trains in Costa Rica, <laughs> I don't think. So we're going to get that one up there. Yeah. Um, um, boats. I'll, I'll just yeah. Uh, speak real quick about that. Um, they try to keep the uh, buses down, so we're looking and we're aiming uh, more for 15 to 25 kids for this trip. Um, if we do get more, they can uh, handle that amount, but it's a small motor coach, uh, you know, because of the trails and the regions that we'll be traveling. Okay. Um, we'll be staying in three to four um, star hotels. They'll be centrally located, unlike the um, European hotels, they're probably a little more remote. So when we're there in the evening, we're there in the evening. So the kids will have to bring stuff to do at night and we'll have activities for them. We won't be going out for a gelato or a McDonald's or anything like that. Um, they will be eating regional style meals there. It has actually been made clear by ACIS. So they'll be eating a lot of rice and beans and seafood and meat. Breakfast and dinner is included. Lunches are not, the kids have to pay, but they will bring us to a place that is safe for them to eat. Um, guided sightseeing is included, all of the bridges, everything is included, um, any entrances that we have, and um, ACIS does offer 24-hour emergency services. And one thing I do want to point out with the travel company that we are going with, this is going to be our third trip, of well, the fifth trip inside district uh, with ACIS, both student and adult trips that we've run. Um, but we're very comfortable with this company. We changed companies after issues that happened with uh, COVID with EF tours. Um, and just for peace of mind, even though we're going um, not in the outback, but more uh, rural areas, uh, they still vet out the restaurants and the eating places that the students will eat. Um, you know, we'll see this all the time with other, um, you know, towns in one of the towns in Massachusetts that actually just came back from Costa Rica. They had an issue with that where uh, they weren't bringing the kids to the vetted, uh, you know, eateries and so on. So that's one of the benefits with this company. And we really do trust this company because we explained to you last year that after COVID, they changed their insurance policy. And we did have a few people who actually had to use it. So if they up their insurance, what's like four, three, three, four hundred dollars? Mm -hmm. If they up their insurance, they can cancel up to four days before for any reason at all. And we did have a few students who had to back out, and they did get their money. I'm not saying it's easy to get your money. There's a lot of paperwork, but they did get all of their money back. We had a student debt back out <clears throat> that day, so, and we got the full amount minus the uh, insurance. It, yeah, it was less than four days yep. and that person actually got it too, so. Um, can you go to the next slide, Mr. Gleason? <coughs> Uh, yeah. So the uh, trip pricing is $42.50, and, and even though that is uh, higher, 
Um, we, we do have some uh, scholarship opportunities through ACIS, uh, you know, students book. So if we do get the permission to go ahead tonight, uh, we'll stop uh, uh, planning for the student and parent meeting uh, to happen in uh, early May. Um, and then they're also offering us a 30-day risk-free. Uh, so if a student signs up, regardless of the insurance policy that they get, they're running a 30-day um, kind of peace of mind where if they decide, you know what, it's just not for us, it's too close, what have you, uh, they can get their money back. And in that price, the tips are actually also included, so yes. we don't have to ask the students for any more money. Yeah, so it includes the prices uh, for the round-trip airfare, uh, the motor coaches. The only thing that we would be responsible for, and we've done uh, fundraising in the past, is the transportation from um, the school up to the uh, airport and back. Uh, sometimes that's been covered by uh, fundraising if we've done it, or sometimes uh, some of the chaperones um, will uh, kick in for that. Uh, these links, uh, you have the electronic copy, but I did want to point out the student civics project. Uh, Ava Caruso, she's a junior, she actually came with us to um, uh, Spain and Portugal trip. Uh, she did some background research um, for, uh, for the trip, and she actually uh, asked students their feedback with, you know, how many, you know, the percentage that would be uh, interested in going on the trip. So if you check out her uh, presentation, I also included her slides on, on this as well. Uh, in the back um, where she couldn't be here because of the play, uh, but I did want to share some of her stuff. Uh, the other stuff that's there is just, you know, the general things uh, in case you had any other questions. Um, uh, undergraduate credit, student credit is uh, students can link up with, um, usually it's Southern New Hampshire University for us. Uh, they can get uh, college credit for their, uh, their trip and their experience based on uh, some um, producibles that they would uh, submit. Uh, the travel scholarships uh, through the um, through ACIS, uh, that link there. Uh, one is an essay contest, one of them is uh, need-based. And then also where um, the only free trip that we take or kickback, let's say, that we get is the group leader gets a free trip. We try to bring as many chaperones as possible, so it's a sliding scale. So like even though they'll give you a free trip for the group leader, it gets uh, brought out to the chaperones. And we can also roll it down into students uh, if there's somebody with like a very high, uh, you know, wanting to go, but you know, a big financial uh, issue. I mean, we do definitely recognize that it's a lot of money to go on these trips, and this kind of trip isn't going to speak to everyone. Uh, mainly, a because of the location and some of the uh, ruggedness involved, uh, but also you know the financial. Um, uh, cost that to associate with it. So we, we, we do want to recognize that, you know, um, it is a pricier trip, um, but this company is really good with uh, the experiences that they give the kids. And again, this is why we'd be coming back for another five-year plan where we can kind of plan ahead with the kids. Yeah, this isn't for, like you said, this isn't for everyone. The last trip that we went on was more about sightseeing and history and architecture, and it was kind of slower paced. This is more for the adventurous type of the kid who doesn't mind hanging bridges and walking through jungles and little critters running around. <laughs> so if you can't tell, like Ms. Kamara Rujo, it was like a hard sell to her. Like, where I'm like, yeah, let's go and get it. But, you know, she wants to kill me, but that's okay. I don't like critters. <laughs> that's my life. The last one, we went to the Galapagos years ago. Um, Mr. Gleason did not tell me, but there was a picture of a snake underneath me while we were snorkeling, and they didn't tell me until I got back, which was a very good thing, because I probably would have seen it. <laughs> if I can do it, anyway, can do it. Um, but at this point, we'll open up any questions that you guys have. Well, I, I'll have one, and you addressed it in some way. But the cost of the trip, it looks like a great trip, and I'd love to be on it. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm more concerned about students that maybe couldn't, or their families couldn't afford these. How, you know, you know how, do you, how are you doing that? To no, I, that, that's will? a great question. I, I mean, ideally, it, it comes down to fundraising. Uh, one thing I, I do want to point out, like, all the chaperones pay for their trips. Right. All right? It's coming out of our pockets as well. Um, so we definitely know the burden of, the, of finances is going on this. But um, it's... If the kids are willing to do fundraising, we do as many fundraisers uh, as possible that we can, like car washes, you know, the restaurant nights, mm -hmm. 
Uh, last time around, we did a plan boil, which brought in uh, a good amount of money and, and so on. Um, they, they get um, social media app links where uh, people can donate, they can do fun, you know, fundraisers through social media as well. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, you're always at that conundrum of, do you offer trips like this to the student body, knowing that, you know, some people will never be able to afford it, or do you not offer it at all? And we, we want to try to offer it and see, you know, is there a way that, you know, some students might be able to go out and, you know, kind of get money for themselves, you know, through fundraising or looking at different organizations. Like, so when I was in junior achievement in high school, um, going out to Indiana for our uh, international conference, I, I hit, like, you know, the AMVATS post 72. Uh, they helped cover my costs as well as um, one of the, uh, the Leo's uh, the Lions Club at the time. So it kind of put me out of my comfort zone and made me kind of ask and approach and kind of present. So, because I know my parents couldn't afford it. So, I mean, it's tips like that that we talk about as well as, you know, fundraising. Um, we usually go with what the kids want to do, though, for fundraising. Sometimes you'll have kids that know we're all set, we're going to find our own financing or, you know, um, but we're there for them if, if, you know, they need to uh, you know, uh, do the fundraising. The other uh, thing that when we've had this kind of question in the past, we had to research domestic trips. Uh, one of the members at the time wanted domestic trips. Why are we just doing international? And our point is uh, we're trying to hit places that maybe, you know, families wouldn't necessarily all go together as a vacation, you know, kind of expose them to that kind of trip. Um, when we did cost out um, a, it was the, um, no, not the, it was the Arizona Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon, oh, Grand Canyon, Canyon. Canyon. yes, yes. Uh, a Grand Canyon trip, and it was, the price wasn't a huge difference between international travel and, and domestic, so that's why we're still staying with the international. So, again, like to wrap up, like we, we definitely, we're cognizant of the prices and some people will definitely be alienated by it, unfortunately, but we still want to offer it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So, the price that I see on here, I know you said that lunches are not included, so is that in addition to this 4000 that the we usually have them bring some spending money, but to be perfectly honest with you, when we went to the Galapagos, it was a little bit different when we went to Europe because we had so many things readily available. But we had kind of had the kids trained, please eat a big breakfast, <laughs> a large breakfast, and they weren't really hungry for the rest of the day. And we also had the kids pack snacks. And then, right. like for the Galapagos and like for this trip here, we would bring extra snacks as well. Um, a lot of times when we do uh, fundraising, or sometimes we've gotten like contributions in the past with uh, some of the chaperones, uh, spouses, what have you, have given us spending money to bring for the kids uh, to basically kind of compensate for the for the lunches. And so, and, and the Galapagos, we actually all took our kids out to lunch. Yeah. We all we all had designated groups, and we all we went to a real nice place too. The Togai Bar is there, and we ended up paying for the lunches. Too. We want them to have a good meal. <laughs> and it's one of those things, it's, it kind of goes back to what Mr. Fencemaker had asked before, you know, it's sometimes kids, you saw it in uh, this last trip, they spent all that money like the first day, mm -hmm. and then you seem like, hey, we're going to go here, and they're like, you know, like, everybody was offered stuff with no, you know, giving, you know, I, I think we have a great group of chaperones, and they're very generous. So. Mr. Machado. <coughs> What happens if you have a student that, yes, I am daring, I'm able to do it, and then you find out it's like a George Austin and gets on top of the bridge and he's not crossing. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why is, I'm gonna pick on my niece, Ava Caruso. You know, this is the kid I used to wait in line for a water slide, and next thing you know, I'm walking her down. So I'm just wondering, what is the plan? There are alternative activities. So with all of the chaperones, we could have, we're not gonna make anyone. I'm going to be honest with you. If there's zip lining, I'm not doing it. So I will be on the ground with the kids. Um, but there's always something for us, something else for the kids to do. Or we could just take pictures. Yeah. Um, We're not so going to make them do anything. They don't have to do the bridges or the zip line or the horseback riding. Um, but in the Galapagos, I think everybody swam. Everyone but did, yes. some people that, um, my nephew, for example, unfortunately had a bloody nose and like, 
you know, he freaked out because, you know, there's sharks in the water. And it's like, hey, kid, I'm the one bringing you back to the boat here. You know, like, you know what? Did you know? Um, but, <laughs> so the poor kid, he like, I mean, he did get to sit on the boat and eat those cookies the whole time. So like, I mean, who, who benefited there? But um, ultimately, uh, it's like uh, Ms. Camarujo said, uh, all the activities, we do have the option of if kids, you know, are afraid of heights or, you know, they have the... Um, uh, they get to that point, they can either come down um, and then do alternative activities. Now, in a lot of those countries, they divide you up anyway. Mm -hmm. um, when we were in the Galapagos, we had to divide into our groups. So this group was doing this activity while this group was doing another activity. And there was one activity that my group actually had missed because of the boat. Yep. The boat broke down. So um, there's always something else for them to do. But um, when I was in Peru, we, I was doing a teacher project in Peru this summer. Um, we did hanging bridges uh, in the Peruvian rainforest, and one of the people that was with us, she was actually the last in line, and she just couldn't move off the platform. She was just deathly afraid. So then one of the guides split up, took her down, and then took her to the rally point, you know, with the, the headquarters where we were going to sleep that night. So same kind of situation, how they were handled. Any questions? So just um, to clarify, so your target is about 15 to 25 students, right? Um, and if I can count, so we've got about 10 months if we would approve this tonight till the trip, which is a pretty good amount of time for fundraising and planning. Um, they usually, just to correct that though, um, the bills are due usually November, December-ish. So um, we could still fundraise after the fact, and then they get the money back, uh, kind of thing. Okay. Okay. okay, if there are no questions, I would entertain a motion to approve the student trip to Costa Rica, planned for February 14th through 22nd, um, potentially 13th, um, 2025. Uh, motion by Ms. Ferrer and seconded by Ms. O'Brien. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 So voted. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, see you um, we'll see you a year from now, I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, just out of curiosity, if we go forward with the uh, a five year program, would you prefer it this year or would you prefer us presenting next year? Or like, when is the best time you think for that? Or does it not matter? So, yeah, I know you're in budget season right now and there's a lot of decisions to be made and I don't want to occupy your time, but My I also attitude. want to try to plan out for the kids as much as possible. My attitude is sooner, it's always mm -hmm. the best, earlier than later because of that one particular reason. You now you have eighth graders who are coming up that they can already think about, you know, this is an opportunity that you have in the school, so. Okay. It would be smart. great before eighth grade night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. Thank, thank, you. You thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. George, you sure you don't want to go? Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item on the agenda is recognition of our March visionaries. Um, the committee would like to commend Torin Estabrooks, Independent, Claire Gloucester, Digital Citizen, Connor Haney, Resilient, Leland Irizarry, Respectful, Grace Kayata, Digital Citizen, Brady Moniz, Academic, Jeet Patel, Academic, and Jacob Pavo, Empathetic. Congratulations to those students for their excellent work. The next item on the agenda under Business and Financial is presentation of the Audit Report Overview for year end June 30th, 2023. And we welcome Anthony Roselli, CPA for that presentation. We'll be participating via Zoom. Hey, Tony, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? Hello? Hello? Can you hear us? Can you hear me? We 
We can hear you. Yes. Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah. All right, I want to get lead. Perfect. Feel like I'm that little animal <laughs> in the back of the car. Dash. How's everyone doing? Great. Good. How are you, Tony? Good. 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 So, um, so Ron, um, do you want me to share the screen or with the financials, or do you want to do that, or? It, whatever's easier for you. If you want to share it, then you can drive to it and switch a, swip, uh, flip to the pages you want to go through. We'll give you sharing options. Do you, do you want to flip through it just in case? Yeah, okay, sure. We can do that. <laughs> sure. I remember last year you had it in shirt. So, so, Tony, this is a generic account. And I'm not logged in, so. All right, let me so ta tag your. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if I, so I'm gonna be able to. Let's see, where are we? Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. 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 Okay, perfect. All right, so my name is Tony Roselli, and I'm the uh, partner of the. Um, the account for the audit of the uh, Somerset Berkeley Regional School District. I don't know uh, if there are any new school committee members, so just doing that for their benefit. And uh, we completed the audit uh, a few months ago, um, got everything done ahead of the deadline, got everything submitted to your bond people, your debt people, a single audit. Um, every, everything basically got done, so now we're here kind of to do to kind of do these, this presentation. So what I'd like to do is go through the um, more important financial uh, areas. And then uh, if you have questions, um, feel free to ask uh, those questions and we, uh, we, can go from, uh, we can go from there. So uh, one of the things I'll note at, at, before I even start into the numbers is that the, uh, the district has done very well addressing um, the findings that we've had for the last uh, several years. And we haven't had anything like overly um, significant, no material weaknesses or anything like that, but we've had a handful of findings uh, that have kind of dwindled down. And this year, I really didn't feel it was uh, necessary to really report anything that was uh, a finding other than some minor things that myself and Ron uh, talked about. You know, really, really nothing um, that, um, would be worth, you know, calling us anything significant or anything like that. So, in the one report that I, I did send, which is a governance report, we do, in that report, we do say that there were no difficulties, there was no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, uh, there were no disagreements, so it's a pretty much a standard report. Uh, we don't need to go through that because it's kind of standard, basically, I, I just kind of uh, highlighted uh, how that report reads. So. Um, so we can jump into the numbers unless there's any questions just on, you know, controls and internal controls and, and whatnot. Um, does anyone have anything, comments or anything? I think we're good. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump into the numbers. So on page um, of the financials, we're looking at page, it's a long page, page 12, if you have it in front of you. And basically, uh, at the We'll focus on the first column is the general fund, and the district had 3.8 million in cash uh, at the end of uh, the fiscal year in the general fund. About 2.2 million of that, you can see, is either accounts payable or accrued payroll and withholdings. So of the 3.8 million, about 2.2 of that is spoken for. So in July and August. Uh, you're going to have these bills come due. Uh, the payroll is summer payroll and withholdings associated with that. So in July and August, those will get paid and the district's cash balance will probably go down uh, to about, uh, let's see, 2.2, in the low one, two, like two range, uh, 2.2, 3.8, 2.2, about $1.6 million. Um, of that, if we come down here, you'll see that 1.4 million is unassigned. And that's the amount that the district has um, moving forward 
to the next fiscal year. That's the amount that the district has. Basically, that's unencumbered. This $244,000 amount is a, an incumbent amount. And, and in this unassigned fund balance, it would include anything the district has, like stabilization funds, uh, your uh, undesignated, your e and is in there. All, all sorts of, of things are in that not particular number. Uh, so that is your general fund, which is in great shape. Uh, the 1.4 million is roughly about 10, 10 or 12 percent of your um, of your of your operating budget. So um, so you've got some pretty decent reserves there. And uh, uh, remind me, Ron, did you go over the 5 percent, or did you stay under on the uh, E and D for uh, fiscal 23? We um, we stayed within the five percent, and we used some of the E and D to fund uh, OPEB contributions. Okay, so yeah, and then I'll get to the OPEB slide in, in a few minutes. But um, so you, so the good news here is you pretty much you, you you've um, put some reserves away, but you've also stayed under the five percent. So um, so that so that's really good. You kind of walk that fine line that the, the districts like to like to walk. Um, the next column is circuit breaker. So circuit breaker, you have to spend whatever you received in the fiscal year, you have to spend the next fiscal year. So the district uh, received uh, or had 911000 at the end of the fiscal year, and that needs to all be spent before the end of the next uh, fiscal year. Otherwise, they, um, they reduce your, you know, they add that to your E&D, and then it starts to become a problem. So. Um, so that is uh, one of the things that um, needs to be spent. That's a you know little under a million dollars, nine hundred and ten thousand dollars. You can see at the bottom here. Yeah. Uh, your high school building project fund had close to six hundred thousand in it. This is a, an account that was used basically to build your seventy million dollar school years ago. Though. That's kind of money left over that wasn't spent. And uh, we've highlighted in the past that it should be repurposed. Is that being used for anything now, Ron, debt service or anything? Or? Uh, a portion of it is being used to offset the annual debt service payments uh, as a percentage allocation based on the principal interest payments. Okay, and, and that is one of the acceptable uses under Mass General Law is to, to pay down the debt that created this uh, on, on an annual basis. So. Uh, so this is going to probably be hanging around for a little bit, but but eventually we'll uh, we'll get paid off. Or you could use it if you wanted on a similar type of uh, uh, project if, if you wanted to repurpose the whole five five hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars. So uh, the non major funds, which is your last column here before your total, that's basically all your revolving funds, your grants, uh, your your other special revenue funds. Basically, things that come in and go out, um, and um, you know, any fund balance is just basically timing because you're not. It's not a. Um, it's not a fund that's intended to accumulate resources in. It's mostly for ins and outs, uh, especially like uh, education grants. Okay. Any questions on this particular slide or page? Okay. The next page is that we would look at is page 14, and that's gonna that's basically your revenues and your expenses. So your revenues in the general fund were 21.5 million, and your expenses were 22.1 million. Uh, the number 21.5 is probably higher than you folks have seen in your budgets for 23, and the reason for that is. Uh, the state pays the teacher's retirement uh, portion, which I think was about $2.4 or $5 million in 23. We have to include that as a revenue in the top, an intergovernmental revenue, so it's up in the 8.6 number, and then we have to include that also uh, in the expenses as an expense. So it's a gross up. Your revenue and expenses gross up. So the number you were probably used to seeing in your budget is somewhere in the 19 high 18 or 19 million uh, range for 23, and that's the reason uh, why that number is larger. Um, now, you had an operating uh, deficit for the year, and that was intentional because I believe in the prior year, Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that you had exceeded your P&D 
So you had to uh, basically lower the assessment in fiscal 23. Uh, so what that, it gives the illusion of a deficit, but it's not a real deficit. It's intended just because you exceeded the E&D. Is that, um, that, is that, that correct? That, that's correct. Payments were issued back to the member communities for that excess E&D from FY22. Yeah. It was done in yeah. FY23. Yeah, normally you like to see a break even, 22 million in, 22 million out. But like I said, in this situation, because you exceeded the 5% E&D in the prior year, it, it caused this to get you back reset. And for 23, you were under 5%, so you won't see this in, uh, in your fiscal 24 report. Uh, the second column is the operations of the circuit breaker, and 1,071,000 came in, 952 went out left you with the 9 and 10 balance that we talked about. Uh, the high school building project uh, looks like a couple of thousand was spent towards the interest expense and there was a transfer out into, you'll see the 26,000 that goes into the um, general fund, that 26 was used to uh, facilitate that service. Uh, so at that rate it's going to take a little bit to pay down, so, um, but, so expect to see that a little bit. And then, like I said, here are your non-major funds, which is all your revolving funds and everything. 2.2 million went out. A uh, little under 2.1 came in uh, for, a, for a little excess. But this is, like I said, all timing, because this is mostly grants and revolving uh, funds. Uh, any questions on, um, on this page? Okay. Next, we can go to the... OPEP, uh, the OPEP page, which is on page uh, 20, page 16, uh, you got a million in OPEP, million one almost, let's see how we got there on the next page. Um, basically, there was a large uh, contribution into OPEP. Uh, you had investment income of 59,000, you had employee contributions of over a half a million, so your OPEP almost doubled, and that's a really good thing to see. I like to see that you're um, looking at your operations during the year and seeing if you have any extra funds that you could put into the other, other into the OPEB fund, because that was a fund that was do, not doing too well. It was, it was very low. And at some point, that's going to become a real liability to the district. So, um, so it's nice to see that there was some contributions made uh, to, um, to, to the OPEB trust. All right, any questions on any of that? Okay, and then in the, in the back, we can look at your budget to actual. Out on page 43. Okay, it looks like your, your revenues were under by about 800000 and again, that's because of the assessment issue. Um, so your revenues came in a little lower than you had uh, forecasted in your budget, and, uh, and your expenses were basically flat, they were basically right on. So that's why your, um, your, um, your fund balance, your unassigned fund balance went, went down, um, or you had an operating deficit for the year. So that is your budget, and this is a number that you're more familiar with that does not include the mass teacher's retirement um, um, items. Okay, that's, that's what I got. Any questions or comments or um, overall, great job. Um, I, I, Ron had indicated this may be the last time we talk and we're all together in the same room, so you know, if that is still true, great, great job, Ron. And, um, I think um, you had a, a, a handful of things that were there at the beginning. You weren't a Massachusetts accounting person, but you learned pretty quick. And we got to the point where we got some pretty good fund balances. We've got OPEP growing. We've gotten rid of all the findings. So I think, uh, I think the district is, district is in a really good place right now. So if I could ask Ms. a couple questions. Mr. Machado. Uh, first, to avoid any open meeting violations, can you explain what EED and OPEP means? Sure. 
So it's excess and deficiency, and we have to actually go through a process with the Department of Revenue. So we basically, they do a validation to see what our revenues are, what our expenditures are, and we have to be within 5% of our previous year operating budget. If not, then we're exceeding the E&D. We can maintain up to 5%, and that's basically what E&D is. And we have to go through a certification process aside from what the auditors do. Mm -hmm. And OPEB? OPEB is other post-employee benefits, and that is the basically the health insurance coverage for our retirees. Thank you. Um, the only really comment that I have for both the district and Anthony while he's here. Uh, Anthony, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, obviously last year we returned money to the member comp uh, towns. Um, that was a little disheartening for me because we had to, uh, because it was over the 5%. We have a turf that's going to be needing replacement. What is our goal to replace this turf? Because how many more years do we have in it? One, two at most. Mm -hmm. At some point we're going to have to re uh, repair it. What is the future plans? Are we going back to town meeting? Asking the member communities for money? Uh, because what was disheartening is we could have probably paid a good half of it or if not more. Uh, to do. So I'm just wondering, that is our biggest expense that I foresee coming, uh, and I'm just wondering how are we going to handle that? So, so I think that may, Tony, if you don't mind, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, we have a stabilization fund, and, and if I understand correctly, I think a stable, stabilization fund also has a limit, a cap that you can put equal to, not greater than the value of what the operating budget is. I think that's a 5% cap as well. Is there other avenues where we can put some additional money away if we have some, some savings in our operating budget to help offset the cost of this artificial turf replacement? And, and, and track. And the track, exactly. And, and the other thing, obviously, we have a high school budget line. Is that something that we can use? Is that about a half a million dollars there as well? Or is that only for physical building items? Or is that... You're talking about the bond proceeds money available? Yeah. I, I think we already got a ruling from bond council on that, that we can't, but we can do repairs to certain fields and areas around the building. All right. So um, I, did, I did have uh, actually reached out to bond council on that. You can do it for that, but you can't do it to replace a piece of equipment that was already purchased by bonds. Yeah. So right now, right now is obviously the football field that I'm, and the track that I'm really concerned. Yeah. And then I know under the superintendent's report, we're going to be talking about the baseball field. So I was just wondering, when I, when I see all of these major expenses that could possibly happen, I'm trying to figure out how we can handle it. it is the goal to assess that back to the member communities or to uh, just use, um, if you have a favorable year, to use um, money that's left over and, 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 and put it aside? Uh, what, 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 what was the... Uh, um, the goal uh, would be the latter. <laughs> the goal would be to ha avoid having to assess the member communities and to instead find an alternate way to cover. Because I'm, so right now you have a general stabilization, uh, Ron? Correct. And you're, are you capped on that, the 5%? We are. So the, so the question really uh, becomes is, um, and I haven't been asked this question, so I don't know it off the top of my head, but I can certainly find out, is if you can create a capital stabilization fund um, as a, a, another dedicated source uh, towards um, towards this, these athletic, what is it, an athletic field, you said, that needs to be... Um, the football field. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's, a, it's the uh, turf field in the, tr the track around the turf field. Yeah, so let me... Um, let me let me think about that. I mean, you've got that little bit in the um, high school uh, in that high school account that right now you're using for debt service, but it's really at twenty thousand a year. It's really not denting things too much. And I'm wondering if you spoke to bond council uh, if that's something you could use um, because it is uh, related to the high school. So I'm wondering if that's something you could use. Uh, re re it would have to be repurposed. Um, 
So that, that's a, a, an area that, that could be explored. And then potentially setting up some sort of a capital stabilization fund would be another area um, that you could um, explore uh, with your um, excess funds at the end of the year. So that, that would be something that um, I, would have, I, I can't answer right now, but I could, could try to uh, do a little research on that. We appreciate that. Yeah. So just to recap, so uh, Mr. Schoonover is shaking his head because it sounds like we've already we've checked in with Ron Council. Yeah, it's just, and Ron can um, clear up anything that I uh, misstate here, but the whatever we use that money for has to be um, at least equivalent in um, the life of the bond. So a turf field is going to be replaced every, say, 12 years or so, and the bond's length of time is more than that. So you can't use it for a, a small investment like that. But if it does, if it involves, say, repairing our baseball field and, and uh, putting in uh, a drainage system there, which you know would be a permanent fix, we could use the high school building project money for something like that. But it, you have to look at the life expectancy of whatever right. it is that you are repairing, replacing, um, and, and compare that to the life of the bond. So if, if I could, so what you mentioned, if we only had 11 more years of the bond, would that be able to be used at that point? Because it's less, it's, it's greater, the turf would be greater than... Allow me to, to dig up the, the yeah. communication yeah. from bond council so that we're giving you the right information. I think Mr. Schoonover provided a pretty good overview with the conversation we had. And I remember at that time, it was kind of a no, but you can do this. All right. Well, yeah. like I said, I, I've been waiting for this meeting to talk about the yeah. turf because it's keeping me up at night mm -hmm. asking the town for a million plus um, or member towns, a million plus. So and I, that's something I'm, I'm having a difficult time doing so, uh, but it also hurts when I know I just gave back about 800000 a few years ago. So sure. I just, just for those members who weren't here, I think it's important to know that the reason, the majority of the reason was because of the yes and money and, and, yep. and COVID and everything else. So we've always been within margin. So I think that was a unique year, but it's always better to give than, than us sometimes. It's always better to give back. So, But sometimes when you give, they forget. <laughs> you just reminded them. Okay. <laughs> So, and, and just to so I, I think we have about 1.4 million in, un, in unassigned cash balance that's between E and D and our current stabilization right now. Yes. Okay. And so we'll explore the possibility of creating a capital stabilization fund. See if we could add to that. So obviously the stabilization in the E and D will come out. And these projects are likely more than 1.4. Mm -hmm. given the going rates or at least a lot more one to two don't anybody write that down I'm just spitballing George <laughs> don't write that down <laughs> <laughs> no. they, they're, they're well north of a million dollars mm -hmm. okay. anyone else have any other questions I would just like to um, uh, thank Mr. Zelli and also I really want to commend uh, Mr. Taro and his team um, for the incredible work that they have done. Um, to have basically no findings is a great accomplishment and one that we very much appreciate. And I also want to recognize a um, former member of our committee, Ms. Ramos Gagliardi, who um, was a champion of um, ensuring that we contributed to our OPEM fund um, a little more aggressively. And so I want to thank her for that as well. So, thank you very much. Right, my pleasure. This need not be your last audit. <laughs> <laughs> your um, I, I'm, I'm glad you acknowledged my staff because when I'm in the throes of this and trying to get the audit done and we're you know trying to finish up the budget and get everything done, so it's good. I also will tell you that Mr. Roselli um, and his team aren't afraid to ask questions and push the envelope and test us to make sure that we really are on task. Because if he's not doing that, then we're not getting better at what we're doing. So I, I appreciate when he's sending new blood in and, and taking a look at, or new staff members coming in and taking a look at that. That's what I want. 
I, I don't want to be compliant and okay or complacent in what we do because you can't improve you can't improve that way. So Tony, uh, thank you for you and your team as well. Thank you. All right. Any anything else? Or? No, I think we're good. All right. I'll I'll see if I can dig out some some way to um, answer your questions on this uh, turf field. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go, um, go see if there's a mechanism um, so you don't have to stay up at night. <laughs> and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can uh, find something, some way to do it. And other than that, uh, Ron, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll reconnect in the next week or so. Yes. And, uh, and thank, you, thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for your time. time. Have a great rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll continue under business and financial. The next item on the agenda is the March financial statement. Mr. Tara. Yes. Um, so basically you're seeing, and I want to just make sure I have the right report. I think I may have left it on my desk. Give me one second to open it up. Um, I'll give you the abridged version. Um, we have, you know, we'll be right now based on projections and where everything is. I was able to reconcile all the positions that we have, people that may have been on medical leave, leave of a family medical leave, um, transportation costs, utility costs, kind of project those out, what the substitute uh, lines are as far as the remainder of the year. Health insurance for retirees versus active, we looked, I looked at those. So basically, you know, we're, we're gonna be ending the year in the positive. I have not completed my transfers to make sure I'm utilizing all federal funds, uh, which would be IDEA for, for, um, uh, for out of district tuition. I, am, I did make sure that we're already using our circuit breaker money as allocated, received in FY23, we're using in FY24. So we will be, we will be ending the year in the positive um, and we'll be looking at prepaying tuition um, up to, I think on the region side, I was looking at both districts, about 200, we could pay up to $200,000 for prepaid tuition for July and August and or make some contributions to OPEB and or maybe make a contribution to another fund based on Mr. Rosalie's findings. And so we, we are ending the year favorably. Uh, there was some adjustments that I'm looking at as far as uh, school choice, or revenues where I anticipated we should be or down a little bit and expenditures are up a little bit. I think I reported that out when we go through the budget process. But overall, you know, we're over in some lines, you'll see that. We spent a lot of money in some of the security lines. We made some improvements that came out of a report that was done a year ago or so. And we're continuing to make those improvements and make the investments, those one-time investments. Uh, we made an investment this year in Spanish books, is, and that's, you'll see the textbook line that's over about $40,000. And that's because of that particular purchase to get those materials in now so we didn't have to carry them in the operating budget. Um, and I think most of them pretty much on target. Special ed out of district tuition is still one of those things that are going to fluctuate and we're going to, if we can make the transportation work internally, we're doing that. And that's, that's basically why we're at where we're at. So we're able to do some of those things in-house versus uh, contracting out. Anyone have any questions about the March could you just clarify for me? I know I saw a note at the end on page yes. nine about the debt service plus yes. one interest payment. Could you just yeah? So it actually looked like that. I can understand. Yeah, sure. So if you look at the the last page, and I don't have the, I don't have it in front of me, but the numbers are. Um, I thought it looked like a, a deficit of about ninety thousand or eighty thousand. So what had happened was. Um, I'm carrying an open purchase order for principal and interest so it doesn't show like it was paid. And I closed out the purchase order because the debt service payment was made, but I closed it out in April. So it looks like we have it, we, we overspent for principal and interest. So that footnote says basically if I reverse that, if that entry hit as of March 31st, then we would have probably had a, a positive uh, balance of about half a million dollars in the account, 400, just about half a million dollars. 
Oh yeah, like 507. Yeah, 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 okay. I saw that footnote. Yep. Okay, I just make sure I understood the footnote. Yeah, good question. Thank you for explaining. Does anyone else have any other questions? We always like to hear when it's to the good. Thank you. I'm, I'm always glad to report that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next item on the agenda is continued discussion of the 24-25 budget. Stop. One, um, I still feel very comfortable with the budget that we voted on, um, but it was great to get that memo from uh, Mr. Schoonover regarding the proposed budget from the House, which will, uh, I, I believe it jumps from $30 a student to a possibly $104. 104, right. So that's, you know, that's nice to hear. Obviously, it hasn't been approved yet, so we're remaining at the $30,000, but... Uh, at this point, I feel uh, reviewing it further, uh, I think the budget committee did its work and I still feel extremely comfortable with that number at this point. So. And then that updated house budget, which is again, not a thing yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are any other updates, is that right? No, not really. Uh, as Mr. Machado just said that the house number would be an increase of $70,670 over uh, the governor's proposal. Uh, but obviously, the Senate has to come up with theirs, and then the House and Senate will meet in conference and then recommend something out of that. So uh, we we'll just have to wait and see what happens over the next couple of months. The only other number I wanted to share related to the budget, and it's really on the back in the last conversation, but just to give... The, the numbers you were talking about the E and D and the stabilization is about 1.4 million. Uh, Mr. Taro presented at the public hearing the E and D balance is 800, just under 891 thousand dollars, and stabilization is at 458, 458,515. That was as of January 31st. So just so you have those two values, um, and five percent of a roughly $20 million budget, we have thresholds of about a million dollars, I think a little bit under a million dollars. So that 890, you can tell for E&D, is right up against that cap, close to it. Thank you. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is the public hearing on school choice participation for the 2024-2025 school year. So I would open the public hearing at this time. Okay, so I, I, I apologize for not getting you the information earlier, but you, um, I know every year for this I rattle off some numbers, I see people writing them down, so I just wanted to have, I uh, wanted you to have the information for you um, in front. So just to show where we are right now in, for school choice for the 23-24 school year, you can see the numbers by grade level. We have a total of 55 students right now attending Somerset Berkeley through school choice. Um, and then at this point, we always look at Somerset Middle and Berkeley Middle. Uh, what's the total population in each of the schools? Which students, how many students are going to Diamond, Bristol Plymouth, Bristol Aggie, private schools? Uh, so as of a couple of weeks ago, uh, once uh, students found out uh, if they were accepted to Diamond or Bristol Plymouth, now we have a better idea of what their um, choices are. So for Berkeley Middle, uh, there are currently 96 eighth graders, uh, 51 of them uh, plan to attend Somerset Berkeley, and that includes six school choice students. Uh, Somerset Middle School, this is our, the smallest class in a very long time that we've had, it's 173 students. A year from now we'll be saying how it's a larger class, uh, it's just a significant difference between the current eighth graders and current seventh graders. But we have 173 and 36 of those as of right now. Uh, we know that they're going to other locations. Uh, so really we have 182 students who are residents of Somerset or Berkeley who we uh, think will be attending Somerset Berkeley next year. Uh, and then an additional six students from Berkeley Middle School who are school choice who can come um, who are grandfathered in to attend school choice here and are planning to do so. 
So that really puts us at a total uh, ninth grade population of 188 students next year, including those six school choice. Uh, I spoke with Dr. Brelsford and we're always looking at our school choice numbers and you know we, we've tried to often have about 15 or so students. Um, so even though, and this is, a, this is a difficult one because this is a smaller class, so there's definitely capacity to have more students come in, but then I think I've expressed, I know I have uh, in the past, um, just relying too much on school choice as well. Um, at first I was going to say, I was going to have a recommendation of 18 total uh, students to bring us to uh, 200, uh, but then that's 10% of is a 10% increase over our existing population in ways typically, historically we've been about 5% of our students uh, have been school choice. Um, so I spoke with Dr. Prelsford. Our recommendation is to have a total of 15, so it would be the six coming from um, Berkeley Middle School plus an additional nine. Um, that would give us a freshman class, a class of 2028 of 197 students, still um, probably about 50 students under what we would typically, uh, what we historically had. Um, and I do have a typo on the second to last line. I had the, the approximate uh, enrollment next year would be 901. I was not including our 11 students in our 18 plus program, so actually the, um, the, the enrollment would be uh, projected to be 912 to start the school year. Uh, with 15 total school choice students, uh, which would be an increase of three students over the current year's school choice enrollment. So we go from 55 to 58. Uh, some of Berkeley's done a nice job of maintaining that enrollment of a thousand or so students, while every other district around us has experienced these significant decreases. But now it's getting to the point where it's affecting our two communities as well. Um, at the same time where, and I, I think I said this at the last meeting of the meeting before, where our vocational schools around us and others are expanding, uh, when the total enrollment is going down, it's just, it's, it's making for a, a, a challenging uh, situation for us. But uh, anyway, for school choice, that would be uh, my recommendation. Are there any questions? Um. This past year, we also opened up some sophomore because of the closure of um, um, Coyle, Coyle. Ca mm -hmm. Coyle Cassidy. Um, Bishop Conley. Uh, Bishop, Bishop Conley. Bishop Conley. Yeah. That's what everybody's going to well, Ca <laughs> Cassidy's closing out. No. Well, they already did. They already did. <laughs> they already did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my question, how many, um, how many students did we turn away last year? Do we know? For the sophomores, or no, you, you uh, mean just for, 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 for the freshmen? Uh, you know, I I don't remember. Um, we have the sixteen who are here. Uh, I can't. I can't remember. Okay. We didn't turn anyone away. Okay. Okay. Thank I, you, Robert. <laughs> that that was that was my only question because obviously with the school of 912, with the school that was built for a thousand, you know, mm -hmm. A, I like smaller classrooms and potentially, but I always, I'm terrified of losing <clears throat> programs that we might get to, especially after a year like this year was difficult to look at the budget. So, but all right, that was, that was my only, it's not like we're turning away 20, 30, 40 kids either, so. Mm -hmm. No, you know, every year has been, uh, some years a little bit off of the others, uh, some years we do, when we have to have a lottery, uh, there may be four or five, maybe up to 10 in some years where uh, if we're accepting 15, we receive 25 applications. There have been other years where we received fewer applications than we had available spots. Yeah. And, and, and then sometimes we will have a lottery, accept someone in, and then they turn it down, and then ultimately everyone who applied uh, is able to get in because of some people making decisions not to come. No, I, I'm just looking at it uh, in a few years, it's going to be a little bit even lower numbers when uh, Diamond mm -hmm. uh, 
Bristol Ag, I, you know, they're all be accepting more students. Uh, so those are numbers that are going to hurt our school population as well. So, okay. So I just want to clarify because actually this I saw a question on social media about this the other day and I didn't want to answer it incorrectly, so I didn't answer it at all. Um, but I want to clarify. So for students who attend Berkeley Middle School through school choice, um, they are automatically offered. They're grandfathered in for like that's our policy or no. The current the, uh, or? A few years ago, and I forget exactly what year it happened. Uh, the state changed the, the regulation about school choice. So it had been, if you attended a feeder school, you automatically could enroll in the high school. Uh, a few years ago, they did away with that rule and they grandfathered in anyone who was already in kindergarten at that point under school choice. Mm -hmm. It's probably somewhere around upper elementary school at this point where, the, where those where that grandfathering in happens. I think it was 2019. You had to yeah, be it was, in by it was 2019. Like eight, yeah, it was. That's right, because we were just looking at that. Yeah, I think it was the, you had to be enrolled by the 2000 by 2019. Otherwise, you are yeah. not automatically grandfathered. So it's about fourth grade or so right now, give okay. or take a grade level. So there, for, so for, for the next for years. the foreseeable future, for the next five or so years, kids are all set. But then after that, there isn't the automatic guarantee that they could come. Okay, so they would they have would to go into the lottery system like everyone else. Process. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you. And then just to reiterate, so, and then the, the um, concern with limiting the school choice is also sort of to preserve the historical sort of balance or percentage that we've had in terms of students who reside in either community um, and not to have so many school choice students that we change that drastically. Is that right? Okay. All right. If there are no other questions, I would entertain a motion to have. All right. Let me make this nine plus the six. So is it fifteen? Is my number? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nine plus six. Okay. I would entertain a motion to have fifteen spots available. Um, for school choice for incoming freshmen, um, there will not be any spots available for upperclassmen. Is that correct? So moved. Second. Um, motion by Mr. Machado, seconded by Ms. Ashley. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda this evening is a superintendent's update. Oh, about the yeah, I missed that. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm back track. I missed that. Yeah, really. Is there any public <laughs> input regarding <laughs> school choice? Yes. Okay. There is not. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, I was so motion close to close the public yeah. hearing. Thank you. Close the public hearing. Um, so we'll redo that vote. So, uh, motion to close motion to close the public hearing made by Mr. Machado. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Ashley. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> so voted. And Madam Chair, with the uh, lack of public input on this, I would uh, just uh, refer back to our original vote and leave it as is. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Now we can move on to the superintendent's update. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I did share with you in a memo recently, but I just wanted to uh, share it publicly as well. Uh, the high school recently received uh, two different grants uh, in the amounts of $20,000 apiece. Uh, one is for um, an acceleration academy that will be taking place this summer. Uh, this is, I think we've received uh, two of these previously. I think this is the third time since COVID that we've received a, a grant like this. Um, so the goals of the grant is to provide in-person instruction of about 20 to 25 hours uh, in one content area during either a one-week or two-week uh, academy in small class size settings, a dozen or so students uh, per classroom. Uh, for the high school, for high schools to receive these grants, you have to target rising sophomores. It's really, it's, there's the, the 
the aspect of MCAS preparation involved with this. Uh, so we will be offering uh, programs for rising 10th graders in both ELA and math during the week of August 12th. So I'm sure the high school will be communicating, uh, will be identifying students who they want to invite in, but um, uh, my guess is that we all, based on past history, there would also be other slots for other students uh, too if they're interested, but the high school will be communicating that information. Uh, we also received a genocide education grant in the amount of $20,000. Uh, and this is to support teaching and learning related to the history of genocide. Uh, there are a number of uh, priorities for the grant, aligning materials, curriculum, and professional development, uh, increase uh, access to high quality genocide education, uh, and opportunities to work in partnership with relevant organizations uh, and local community members. So uh, for someone at Berkeley's grant, we are partnering with Facing History in Ourselves as well as the Bristol Community College's Holocaust Center to provide both professional development um, for our teachers and guest speakers for our students. So congratulations to those who were instrumental in applying for those grants, uh, those successful grants. Uh, as Mr. Machado mentioned, um, he had a question recently about the baseball fields and uh, we've had, I, I was checking before today's meeting, uh, at least for the general Providence area, uh, we've received uh, about 24 inches of rain since the start of the calendar year, uh, including um, about 14 inches from March 1st until today. Uh, and we all know, we've <laughs> it seems like we have a discussion uh, like this every March or April. Our baseball field has historically poor drainage. Um, has before this, that field um, on the south side has had poor drainage since before this new building was constructed. Um, and you couple that with historically high amounts of rainfall and we have a baseball field that if you look at it, it looks good, but when you're out there as I was last week, it's soggy. It's, um, there is a, an area or two of some standing water, particularly after the rain that we had the other day. Uh, and we did attempt to roll it. We haven't even had a chance to roll the fields yet because of all the rain that we've had since January. Usually that would take place a few weeks before the season starts just to make sure that uh, everything is level and anything that happens over the winter months is uh, leveled off. And I, I think we had, um, we attempted it and there was, um, I don't know, if, if a vehicle was, was stuck or, or, or just couldn't, couldn't uh, really do what it was intended to do, and we haven't really been able to touch it since then. And we're hoping last week with the warm weather that we had, and warm sunny weather, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, with some dry winds, that that was going to alleviate the problem, just dry it up enough so we can get the roller out there and, and do the, the necessary work. Um, it's still not to the condition where we can even do that yet. Uh, our baseball team has been, um, They've been playing mostly on the road at this point because of that. Uh, they have had a home game or two in Berkeley, uh, which I understand the Berkeley baseball fields are uh, very well maintained. It's a, it's a great facility, um, but we have to practice at other locations uh, and play our games, home games um, there. So there's that transportation component that um, we're now facing. Uh, Mr. Taro, um, Mr. Carrero and I have been talking about this, Mr. Francis, just trying to figure out how we can, if there's anything that we can do, but it's mother nature and there's no way to dry a wet field without having some non-wet weather, just some sunny, windy conditions would be ideal. Um, so we are uh, crossing our fingers that over the next, if you look at the 10 day forecast or so, uh, that we should be able to get out there by hopefully the end of this week, if not the weekend, because we do have, I think nine or nine of the last 10 or 10 of the last uh, 11 games are scheduled to be at home starting next week. So we're hoping that we can do the necessary work to get that done. Um, it's a lot of hoping, it doesn't solve the problem, 
But what the problem is, and getting back to the initial discussion about the uh, high school building project funding that we still have of $558,000, uh, Mr. Taro, and, and just jump in whenever you, you want to, um, he was uh, speaking with uh, a state... Um, uh, state approved state vendor who we can bring in without having to go out to bid. Just to expedite the process. But when we do that, if we can get through this season, um, we'll have to get that done that w and that does require some growing seasons for the work that they have to do uh, so they, that could if we do it in the end of May early June when the baseball season's over keep our fingers crossed we could play out there next spring if it requires three growing seasons a spring fall and a spring it really we would have to um, we won't be able to play on the field next spring either, which has been the struggle that we've had with this at the same time where we don't have a middle school baseball field. Uh, we, we really have, uh, outside the high school, we have one baseball field left in town at South Complex that's large enough for high school sports. Pottersville as well, but I, I don't know what's happening um, there with creation, uh, the creation of some t-ball fields that were um, planned. So it's, it's just this, you know, all of these different circumstances are happening at once, creating this far from ideal condition for us, for our players. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's where we are right now. Uh, we're we're hope, I said, hoping that conditions change in the next few days and our players can get out there and finish the season strong at home. Um, and if not, we'll continue to play our games in Berkeley and get, get our kids practicing in whatever ways that we can get them uh, some time on some fields around here to practice. Any questions? I, I just have, uh, obviously, I would like to fix the problem. Mm. You know, last year we were hoping that whatever Band-Aid, mm -hmm. it wasn't going to be a Band-Aid, it was going to be a solution. It obviously isn't. <clears throat> I'd rather prepare to use or ask the town of Berkeley to use their fields for all of next year and budget the transportation, mm -hmm. have it, you know, if we do need the, <clears throat> the three seasons to grow. Uh, but, you know, one of the things, you know, when you're building these fields that to be used, you know, obviously at the next town meeting, we're going to be asking for fields. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the purpose for the fields is to be used. And right now, when I hear that, you know, we're making last minute calls because of the field is wet, um, why can't we have a field like Berkeley? And, you know, and that's what I'm trying to get to. I would like to see not, um, as a member of the town, as a school committee member, and also a taxpayer of, I would like to be sure that what I'm, or what I paid for is the correct item. So uh, I really would like us to really consider fixing the problem, mm -hmm. not finding a way, a cheap way out. So that's, that's my only comment. And I think, um, our students deserve it, mm -hmm. um, and especially when this town only has one or two fields. Well, if we don't fix that, this town will always have one or two fields. So that's why I'm really would like to force upon ourselves to correct the problem now. And that's why that high school building project money, if it's and we can get the the answer about the life of the bond that's still remaining, um, and compared to the total life of the bond. But this is the type of work that that money, what, what we were told several years ago, is really intended for, a, a long-term project. Um, we don't know what the, the cost will be. We'll find that out soon. And, but that high school building project money, I think, is, is the right avenue to, to fund this. So we can help. We can use the stabilization and everything else to help replace the turf uh, field that, and, and track repairs. And on the side note, whoever did do our fields, please let me know the names because I don't ever intend on using them again, well, unfortunately. And this is why, uh, and I don't want to you know, get into a uh, Somerset Middle School building project, but this is why we're, we're planning on 
doing the fields there with the proper drainage at the very beginning mm -hmm. because of the experience that we've had here. And we had that debate um, about should we do it, should we not? Like, no, we're not going to repeat the errors that were made here because there was, Carlos says, that they knew that, this, that these fields had poor drainage. Um, but we didn't, for whatever reason, you know, put the, the proper drainage system in to alleviate that and get the, the water flowing out and away and, uh, rather than puddling in our fields. Well, obviously you just heard from me as yeah. one member. I don't know how the other members feel, but um, I, I just think we need to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. so. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. Same. So we'll give you updates when we get this vendor in. Uh, who can in, in part of it, Mr. Machado, I agree with you 110%. The last thing you do is throw a few dollars at something and never really fix it because you're <clears> wasting <throat> money. And it's really critical that we find the right vendor who has the experience mm -hmm. and the knowledge and the know-how to know what the, what the fix is instead of us guessing. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think we have somebody who's really... Uh, I'm optimistic about this person, but I, we have a meeting coming up pretty soon, so yeah, we'll make I, sure we keep you posted. I, I would do, you know, ask the questions because even yeah. though they're on the bid list, if it's not the correct person, right. then that's useless to us. So, um, so I'm glad that you have that same yeah. mindset. Let's do it. Oh, correctly. absolutely. So. That's the only way I will. Mm -hmm. All right, great. We'll look forward to an update if you have a chance to meet with that vendor. And just, I always ask Dr. Brouster if there's anything that she wouldn't want me to mention, but uh, everything she said, Mr. Vieira said, uh, for her, career fair, credit for life tomorrow, AP testing, um, and she's also going to be surveying all of our students. I think she's sending it out tomorrow just to get their feedback about the career fair, uh, so we can use that to plan next year's. But um, I was able uh, to be here that day, attended, um, six or seven different sessions. Uh, they were all, everyone I went to was outstanding. Uh, we had, uh, I think he said 48 or 50 uh, different people who were here from filling up the Performing Arts Center and the DLC to 20 or so people in classrooms all over the building. Uh, there was some, just a variety of different occupations that were here and it seems like it was really well received by kids. So we'll definitely be doing it again next year and uh, looking to expand it. Okay. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Schoonover. The next item on the agenda, and I believe Mr. Machado requested this at a previous meeting, um, kind of spurred on by our budget conversation that we had, um, is an um, some information about the district's responsibility for school nurses, and I know that Mr. Schoonover provided us with a communication uh, earlier today regarding that, so in case you have a chance to look. It is in the folder now. Well, um, if I could just, um, you know, there is this concept around town or around social media that um, schools are required to have nurses um, and though this community and the district has always had a nurse in the building um, and we will continue to do so with our current budgets uh, not only the K-8 and also because obviously that has been proposed so far, but here at the regional side, uh, we do have in our budget a nurse, but it is, there are times where, um, you know, a nurse will be out and a lot, the very quick thing people say, oh, we're not in compliance, they're going to report us to the DPH. Um, and seeing that letter, it seems like asking parents to come in is a, legitimate mm -hmm. reason because of the hard to find uh, substitutes and things like that. Um, I think a bigger picture for the administration is now that we won't have a floating nurse is we may want to come up 
we might want to have a future joint meeting and allow nurses to jump from district to district, but that's more of a joint meeting discussion when uh, <laughs> if the time being, because I think the concept of having a nurse at one building might not be the correct uh, practice moving forward. We may have to stop moving nurses um, from building to building to accommodate the needs, especially if nurses are out on vacation or whatever the case may be, personal days. So, uh, but it was really good to hear. I know that, you know, obviously there are students that have a requirement. Uh, those are different issues, but I don't know if we do, but, uh, um, but it, the letter makes, you know, now if people come up to us and say, hey, my child uh, didn't have a nurse and, um, but I also think that we need to have a plan in place with the administration where if the child has an allergic reaction or needs uh, insulin or all of that, someone from the administration or folks from the administration should have access to that if the child in the high school might be a little different than uh, obviously grade schools, but you know, if the student is capable of providing, you know, Sometimes they know better, like uh, Ms. Dr. Brelsford said, sometimes the, patient, the student knows better than mm -hmm. the actual administration, which is great, uh, as long as we are there to see and if the parents allow it. But I think we need to put a plan in place, and I'm sure we do, uh, but I want to make sure that with one nurse at the high school that we do have other folks with the keys to uh, the box and are ready to actually uh, and train to do the work that might be needed. Mm -hmm. And one very small update, but in the re and recently we've added two sub nurses to our sub list. So at least we we still continue to post for substitute nurses, um, and the, we do not have a lead right now. So I I interviewed a, one of the nurses um, worked with me, and we interviewed another sub nurse. So we did recently add two sub nurses to our list. Um, I did reach out to two other uh, agencies as well because we do contract with agencies. Um, and one agency that does not typically do per diem nurses um, is willing to work with us. So I told them right now we're in, we're in a decent place, but I would like to follow up with a meeting uh, over the summer so that we have something in place if we need to use that for the fall. We do use cultured care right now, and there are times that they're able to send us someone and sometimes they're not. So I wanted to have another agency that we could work with. But we will continue to build our sub-capacities um, and hope that if you know um, nurses are able to put their time, other than sick time, obviously in ahead of time or field trips, we'll able we'll be able to plan effectively and um, have the coverage. Yeah, we do have. Uh, it's happened in the past where we've had nurses, even between districts, will go and support one of the other schools, whether it's you know, one of the two nurses here in the past going over to support Somerset School, or we've had it in the past where. For some reason, this building didn't have the nurses, and then someone from Somerset came over to support at Somerset Berkeley. Uh, and, and even uh, I had a conversation with Mr. Yulucci um, uh, a couple of months ago about this, and he said, hey, have you ever thought about contacting the town nurse? And I said, you know, I, I had not. And so he, he made that recommendation, saying, hey, if you're ever in a pinch, if it's a day that person is in Somerset, not Swansea, give it a shot, uh, you know, she might be able to come over and give some medication or, you know, whatever is necessary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any more questions? Thank you for that information. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda, um, although I think, we, I think we're gonna table updates from Somerset and Berkeley at this point, so we do not run afoul. Mm -hmm. um, um, open meeting law. Uh, so then the next item on the agenda, topics not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. I don't have any. All right. um, action items for future meetings. Um, anything other than what has been discussed this evening? I'm going to update on the baseball field situation once we have one. Um, we'll also await an update after the auditor has had a chance to do research and confer with Mr. Tao on a capital stabilization fund. Any other items? So can we get some information on the schedule for uniforms?
for sports. A rotating schedule? Yes. Sure. Because I was provided one last year, but that didn't happen this year. It's actually teams fundraising for uniforms. Really? Yeah. I wonder, well, okay. Reorg also. We have three reorg reorganization of the. Oh, yep, we already have that. Yep, three organization. We have there for next year. Any other? I wanted to talk about next year's meeting schedule and see, uh, and this might be an agenda for a joint meeting as well, uh, if you feel it's more appropriate. Um, but I think it would be great if we could coordinate uh, our meetings and streamline things for the administration mm -hmm. and for ourselves. But I think that's a family suggestion. Yeah. Okay. And then Ron will stay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all to make Ron stay. Mm -hmm. Out of peer pressure. Yes. 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 <laughs> no more doodles holes. <laughs> Great. Anything else for next meeting? All right. Um, moving on, the next item on the agenda um, is to consider approval of the following minutes. Although I actually had a question on the um, open session minutes of the 26th. So before we do this, does anyone else have any questions on any other minutes for the open session meetings of either March 19th or March 26th? Well then, I would entertain a motion to approve the open session minutes of March 19th as presented. Second. Motion by Ms. Ferrer and seconded by Ms. O'Brien. Anything on discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, so voted. I'll abstain. Oh, thank you. I wasn't on the committee. And then I had a question and I, it's quite possible I'm wrong. Um, but I noticed on the open session minutes of March 26, under um, the public hearing on budget, let me go to that. it says that um, Mr. Tarot, about the one, two, three, fourth line down, the district will receive an increase of $70 per student in Chapter 70 funds. That should be $30, $30 per down. student? Is that right? Yes, 30 okay. It was a minimum. Okay, time. we got the minimum, right? I wish it were 70, <laughs> but... So that was the only correction I had. Does anybody have any other? Okay. So I would entertain a motion to approve um, the open session minutes of March 26th as amended. Second. A motion by Ms. Brewer and seconded by Mr. Fenstermaker. Anything on discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And all abstain. Thank you. Okay. And then at this time, I'll entertain a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees asks me paraprofessional and custodial units and cafeteria MOA um, and pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 30A Section 21A7 to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements to consider the release, redaction, and withholding of the March 19th, 2024 Executive Session Minutes and the March 26th, 2024 Executive Session Minutes and the committee will return to open session. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Ashley and seconded by Ms. O'Brien. Uh, anything on discussion? We'll do a roll call vote. Um, those in favor, Mr. Machado? Aye. Ms. Ashley? Aye. Mr. Fenstermaker? Aye. Ms. O'Brien? Aye. Ms. Ferreira? Aye. And the chair votes aye. All right, so we will return to open session. We're going to defer the first item on the agenda, um, approval of MOA, uh, as we do not have that yet. Um, and we'll move on to the second item on the agenda, which is approval of executive session minutes. I would entertain a motion to approve the following executive session minutes as presented. March 19th, 2024 and March 26th, 2024. So moved. Second. Uh, motion by Mr. Machado, seconded by Mr. Fenstermaker. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And I'll abstain. 
So voted. Next on the agenda, I would um, entertain a motion to release the March 19th, 2024 executive session minutes and to release the March 26th, 2024 executive session minutes. So moved. Motion by Mr. Machado and seconded by Mr. Fenstermaker. Anything on discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. And I'll abstain. <laughs> so voted. Um, and with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, motion by Ms. Ferrer and seconded by Ms. Ashley. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.